So our final uh, talk, and another person I admire greatly, uh, okay. David Spiegelhalter, who, Winston Professor of the Public Understanding of Risk at University of Cambridge, uh, doyen of, the, of many uh, uh, science, popular science programs, but also someone who combines absolutely impeccable uh, knowledge of the quantification uh, methods that are around, <coughs> but also a very healthy attitude about what their limits are. So uh, thank you, David. Thanks very much. Um, great pleasure to be here. And um, I, I must say, I, I don't know if they're, they're still here, but I do respect the way the demonstrators are treating the occasion. So I'd like to thank them very much for, the, for that. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm just terribly sorry if I'm just going to bore them senseless. That's the thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I got this title. I, I realized uh, people talk about un public understanding and what an, an anachronistic title I've got, public understanding of risk. But I thought, well, oh, I could change it to public engagement with risk, but then it just sounds like I'm going to encourage people to go base jumping or something <laughs> like that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, if anyone can think of a better title, I'm willing to have a go. Um, the other thing is that uh, I'm, I'm probably the only person here in a maths department, a pure maths department. So I, I'm not, I don't think I'm in a position to make any grand global statements. So instead, I'm going to tell stories some examples of some of the things I've been involved in um, and on communicating risk and uncertainty. I'd like to start off with breast cancer screening and then talk about scales of uncertainty. Now, breast cancer screening is a fascinating topic that actually covers many of the issues we've been discussing. Deep scientific disputes. Um, there's the sort of, what you consider the traditional pro-screening group, uh, but the, what you might call the anti-screeners are not skeptics and what, what shall I call nutters. These are, you know, it's a very, these are very eminent scientists, a lot of doctors, a lot of general practitioners, who essentially are extremely skeptical of the screening program and have been questioning, in particular, the patient information leaflets. This has been taken on board, and by next April, there'll be new patient information leaflets for starting on breast and then going through cervix and bowel. And I'm on the, on the group advising on the creation of these new leaflets. Um, what's interesting is that they wanted to review the evidence, and one of my colleagues got phoned up by the cancer czar, Mike Richards, to say, we want you to work on the cancer screening review evidence panel, and he said, I know nothing about breast cancer screening, and he said, Mike Richards said, splendid, splendid, you're just the chap we need. <laughs> so the, committed, the review panel comprised people who had never worked in breast cancer screening before. So that's the first innovation. This has got so many innovations, this lot. First innovation is this, this review, which appeared in The Lancet, was conducted by people who had never worked on breast cancer screening and weren't tainted by these two, expert, two groups who had been arguing. Okay, the second innovation, um, which is mentioned, which relates to the last talk, is that this is the whole idea of breast cancer screening is trying to get away from paternalistic medical advice. It's the, in the whole thing of shared care and informed choice. This is for the patient to, to decide. The massive innovation is that the new leaflet will present the pros and cons and will not make recommendations. Uh, as far as I can know, it's the first time a health information leaflet has gone out without recommending that the woman attend screening or, or goes to cervix screening or attend bowel screening for, for 55-year-olds. So this is a, a, a massive change of policy. D controversial, indeed. It could very well lead to a reduction in the, in the screening coverage. However, that's, the, that's one of the innovations. So um, what happened, uh, I, one of the aspects, the other aspects about this, is that there's been a citizen's jury set up. This is now published on the, on the website Informed Choice about cancer screening, who's setting that up. I presented evidence to the citizens' jury. It was uh, made up of, um, run by the Office of Public Management. Fascinating and really um, humbling experience of working with these women, 25 women selected, who sat there for two days, taking in all the evidence. And the bit I was doing was presenting uh, the evidence from the review in many different formats. You know, here are the numbers, but here's all that. I think I sh showed 14 different pictures. Pie charts, pie chart, pie chart, everything. Every picture you could think of. Poor things. And I wasn't allowed to say which one I liked best. And um, so, for example, this is one of the ones we presented. Just as an idea. 250 th way things might turn out for you if you're invited to the screening. Using the data from the review, 250 women attend are being invited for screening for, t for 20 years between 50 and 70. 17 will end up receiving breast cancer for treat treatment for breast cancer out of all those women. So, uh, so, so that 17 will receive treatment. Sadly, four will die early from breast cancer treatment in spite of, their, in spite of being detected um, by screening. However, one would have died, one extra would have died if they hadn't, gone f hadn't been invited for screening. 
So that's a 20% increase um, risk, but that 20% is n never expressed as a relative risk. Relative risks, <laughs> not allowed to use them. So it's 20% uh, increased risk. However, three of these women who were treated for breast cancer, possibly quite, you know, with quite um, serious treatment, would never have needed treatment if they hadn't been screened. It, the cancer wouldn't have been detected. It's not important. They'd have never known they had it. They'd have died with it, just as there's more than a 50% chance I've got prostate cancer at the moment, and I'll probably die with it, hopefully not of it, um, is th that many women, these women would... So there's the trade-off. Out of 250, there's one, that's the benefit, that's the harms. What we're doing here, and this relates so strongly again to talk the expression this morning and, and Anne Glover's talk about risk and reward, is what's called, the, the phrase is uniform reporting of harms and benefits. So that's the phrase within the medical world really being pushed, uniform reporting of harms and benefits. The same units, the same images, even the colours have to be carefully chosen. Uniform reporting, you don't, you don't talk, you talk about it the same way. So that's the trade-off. I presented hundreds of different ways. Icon arrays are generally considered by, in psychological experiments to be one of the most effective risk communication methods. And uh, fortunately, <laughs> they like the icon arrays. We're, we're actually going to look like we're going to do a different icon array showing what happens with 200 women screened, 200 women not screened. So that probably is what's going in the leaflet. But um, really good. And so the citizens' jury... First of all, this go relates so much to um, uh, what Andy, what's been said yesterday about framing the question. The scientists, the Lancet Review, answered the question, what's the effect of being invited for screening? And the women said, this is irrelevant. I want to know what's the effect of attending screening. So all the numbers had to be changed from the Lancet paper to, to estimate what would be the effect of attending screening, because that's all that's what's of interest. Who cares about it? This is a public health decision. It's irrelevant to the woman. They want to know what the effect of going is. So there are more estimates, more estimates. Overdiagnosis is the term used throughout the paper. That's they, the women said, that's right, it should be overtreatment. Looks like that should be going into the leaflet as well. Now, they, it, the jury, so a jury that didn't have an absolute control, but as far as I know, pretty well all their recommendations will be incorporated in the leaflet. Really exciting innovation. Now, there's uncertainty. The numbers were very uncertain. We're talking about uncertainty. These numbers, these numbers, these numbers thing were really uncertain. As Andy was saying, they're full of conditionalities. The paper, the Lancet paper, is full up with condition. Well, if this and that, well, it could be that. Um, they're not even, they won't even quantify and put confidence intervals around these. They can, but they'll be far too narrow. So how do you express that in the leaflet? A lot of discussion, battles and forwards. How do we can't... We, we, we produce blur icons, blurring them. No, no, too complicated. So uh, essentially, we've got to, got to say these are the best current estimates, but may change. And that's all. That, that's the expression of unscientific uncertainty. A lot of discussion about should we ex say there's dispute about this stuff, but no, I think we're going to put the best current estimates. So what I'm saying is that this is an example of, I think, many of the processes that we've been discussing go, can happen, can go on, really riveting um, uh, a really riveting experience. Okay, so what about dealing, uh, my second part of my talk is what about, the, it's the uncertainty bit that actually I'm getting more and more interested in. Breast screening is not too bad, you know, these numbers are uncertain, but we've got a, a, a good, fairly good idea of their magnitude. What about other areas? Who is trying to deal with uncertainties? And I've been just looking at different areas of work and how they are, they are trying to communicate uncertainty. And what I mean by uncertainty is not risk, like IPCC using a risk scale of probability, using words and mapping to numbers, but uncertainty about these risks, or even saying we're not even prepared to put a number on these things. How do we do that? Well, the IPCC is recommending, it has been for some time, a measure of confidence in the analysis, in which one expresses, chooses, one works out for the evidence, whether there's limited evidence, medium or robust evidence, and on a scientific agreement, is the low, medium or high? Up in this corner, you've got nice confident conclusions you're willing to put probabilities on. Here, down here, you're not willing to put probabilities on. So the, the, this determines the way in which the results are communicated. Now, th this is a, a bold effort. What's interesting, of course, is looking at how other people are doing it as well. If you look at the national intelligence estimate of the US, a terrorist threat to the US homeland, they're doing exactly the same. They're putting, um, they're, they're giving words and putting them in terms of, of a, a numerical scale. A blurry one, they don't have the rigid boundaries, exactly the same as the IPCC. And then they're expressing their confidence in the numbers they're, they're assessing. This, this other, this, you do an analysis, you come up with some numbers, and then you say, well, <laughs> how good do you think your analysis has been? 
And so again, they say high confidence based on high quality information, low confidence, if scant information, questionable, we may be changing our minds. Now, we may be changing our minds, I think, is the most pragmatic way I find to define good evidence. So, you know, robust evidence means, well, you know, we're not absolutely sure, but we don't think that we're going to find things will change our minds very much. Whereas at the bottom, you say, well, actually, things could change very much easily. And in, in, in the health, they use the grade scale for measuring. So they do a confidence interval, and then say how confident they are about the confidence interval. So it's great. And it's to do with high quality is very unlikely to change our minds. Low quality is very uncertain. But the crucial thing, low quality is um, further research will change what we think, is likely to change what we think. In other words, we're very susceptible, we're very fragile, what we're doing. And it seems to me this is the really, a very really good pragmatic definition. Okay, where can we go from there? I'm, I'm sort of inspired by the killer cucumbers. This is a, I love stories. Remember the killer cucumbers in Germany? Terrible thing. And, um, and then, of course, we're faced with the Spanish Minister of Agriculture stuffing her face with <laughs> organic cucumbers saying they're safe. They were safe. The problem was, you remember, the, they did find E. coli on the cucumbers. It was the wrong E. coli. Do, do people know what the actual culprit was? Anybody know? No, nobody. Sorry? Sprouts, yeah. It was sprouting fenugreek seeds from Egypt. It was, it was, a, it was a, a, a shipload. Of course, a shipload. I don't know how much. It was sprouting fenugreek. That was the culprit. Nobody, nobody, everybody remembers the cucumbers. The Spanish are still trying to sue the Germans for 100 million euros because of the collapse of their cucumber industry. Now, what happened? There's a lovely report, which I really recommend, by Peter Sandman, an American sort of risk communication person, deconstructing the whole dialogue about this and how it went chronically wrong. And he makes some lovely conclusions about uncertainty. He says you shouldn't just even acknowledge, you should proclaim uncertainty. You've got to really acknowledge it. And the most thing that he really comes up with, which is, of course, what IPCC and these others have been trying to do, is to have a scale of uncertainty. And he says, he doesn't even say what the scale should be. He just says you should be able to distinguish between having a shot in the dark at the very bottom to... I'm almost certain there's still a few remaining doubts to clear up. And th this really resonates, and it seems to me that these, these ideas just carry on over the whole thing. What we want, though, is about two more points in the middle, two or three different points in the middle, with a nice phrase that could express it. Um, and he says that the point about that is it allows you to distinguish your level of uncertainty to changes in it. It's like a threat level or something like that, a qualitative level of how confident you are in your conclusions. I love this final conclusion, come across as human. don't know what happened to my numbering system, but never mind. Come across as human. Anyway, so just remember, you've got to be empathetic and, and human. So, ju and just to finish off then, before Andy waves his finger at me, this is just as a case study of how, I as I said, I love stories, how not to do it. There's Gumma force-feeding Cordelia, a uh, 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 British hamburger, beef burger, in 1990, saying it's safe. And, of course, you know, there, there they are smiling. But later on, of course, had to admit they had BSC, and there was a link between BSC and new variant CJD. So it all wasn't such a great safety. And this is always held up as being the worst examples of risk communication. But one thing I wanted to point out, that modern forensic photographic analysis reveals that that is not the bite mark of a four-year-old child. <laughs> so... <laughs> so... <laughs> So, don't believe everything you see. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you.